All right, so get ready because today we're taking a deep dive into something pretty fascinating, um, the link between malnutrition and pressure injuries. It's a connection that's uh, especially important when we're talking about older adults. And we're gonna be looking at this really interesting chapter from a medical textbook all about nutritional care for older adults. Oh, that sounds that sounds like a really important topic. Yeah, it is. And I was really surprised by some of the things I learned. For example, did you know that malnutrition can actually increase the risk of developing a pressure injury by like three to five times. Wow, three to five times, huh? That's that's pretty significant. It is, and another thing that really struck me is that even if someone isn't officially diagnosed with malnutrition, if they have a pressure injury, they still need more protein and energy to help their body heal properly. That makes a lot of sense to me. Healing takes a lot of energy and resources. Exactly. So before we get too deep into the nitty gritty, let's start with the basics. Can you explain what pressure injuries are and why they tend to be more common in older adults? Sure. So pressure injuries, sometimes called bed sores, but it's really a much broader term than that. They happen when there's constant pressure on the skin, mm -hmm. usually over like a bony area. And what happens is that pressure, it restricts blood flow to the skin and the tissue, and eventually that tissue starts to break down. Now, when it comes to older adults, their skin tends to be a bit more fragile, and they may have other health issues or mobility problems that make it harder for them to shift their position and relieve that pressure. So it's not just about lying in bed for a long time. It can happen in other situations too, right? Yeah, exactly. Like if someone's sitting in a wheelchair for extended periods or even wearing a medical device that puts pressure on their skin. Makes sense. Now, you mentioned bed sores earlier, but I know there are actually different stages of pressure injuries, right? Can you walk us through those? Yeah, so it sort of starts with, you know, maybe just some redness that doesn't go away when you press on it. That's stage one. But then if it's not addressed, it can progress to like blisters, open sores, even deep craters that go down to the muscle or bone. Oh, wow. So it can get really serious if it's not caught early. And definitely. And, you know, to complicate matters further, there's also a separate category of pressure injuries that happen on mucous membranes. Oh, right. Like the lining of the mouth or nose. I remember reading about those. They're often caused by medical devices, aren't they? Exactly. Things like breathing tubes, feeding tubes, even dentures can put pressure on those delicate tissues and cause injuries. And what's interesting is that those mucosal membrane pressure injuries, they can't really be classified using the same staging system as pressure injuries on the skin. They just, they look different and behave differently. That makes sense. So we've got all these factors at play, pressure, fragile skin, and even medical devices. What are some of the other things that can contribute to the development of pressure injuries? Well, there's also something called shear, which is kind of like friction between layers of skin and tissue. Like if you think about someone sliding down in a bed, mm. you know, that movement can cause damage, especially if there's already pressure involved. And then we can't forget about moisture. Oh, right. Moisture. That makes sense. Yeah. If the skin's exposed to things like sweat or urine for too long, it really weakens the skin's defenses, makes it much more susceptible to injury. Yeah. You know, it's like, like if you think about like a piece of paper, if you keep getting it wet, it eventually just falls apart. Right. 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 It all starts to make sense now. But we still haven't gotten to the main event. How does malnutrition fit into all of this? Right. OK. So here's where things get really interesting. Mm. Malnutrition, it basically acts like an amplifier, you know, like yeah. it makes pressure injuries three to five times more likely, even if all those other factors we talked about aren't really a big issue. Wow, three to five times. I had no idea it was that significant. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But I'm curious, how does malnutrition actually increase that risk? Uh, what's happening in the body? Well, you know, your skin is constantly renewing itself. It's like a, like a construction crew that's working around the clock to repair and replace damaged cells. But if the crew doesn't have the right materials, you know, the proteins, the vitamins, the minerals that they need to do their job, those repairs are going to be shoddy, right? That's a great way to put it. Yeah. So basically, when you're malnourished, your skin just becomes weaker and more vulnerable to breaking down from pressure or any other kind of stress. And so it's not just about getting enough calories. It's about getting the right kinds of nutrients, right? Exactly. And, you know, it creates this kind of a vicious cycle because you know, if you do develop a pressure injury, your body needs even more nutrients to heal but malnutrition makes it harder to get those nutrients in the first place. Okay, that makes total sense. Now, you mentioned something earlier that I wanted to circle back to, something called the obesity paradox. I thought extra weight might actually protect against pressure injuries, but it sounds like it's not that simple. 
it's a bit counterintuitive, isn't it? But what we see is that while having a little extra weight, like in the class I obesity range, it might offer some cushioning. But when we get into the realm of morbid obesity, the risk of pressure injuries actually goes way up. Oh, wow. So it's almost like a U-shaped curve, right? Too little weight is a problem, but too much weight can also be a problem. Exactly. And it's really important to understand that body weight doesn't necessarily equal nutritional health. Someone can be carrying extra weight, but they might still be lacking those key nutrients especially protein. Okay, that's a good point. So how does that play into the obesity paradox? Well, in some cases, that excess weights might be masking, like underlying muscle loss. Mm. And that muscle loss, it actually weakens the skin, makes it more prone to pressure injury. So it's almost like, like a building with weak supports, right? No matter how thick the walls are, if the foundation is weak, the whole structure is at risk. Exactly. And this brings us to a really crucial question. What can we do about it? How can we prevent and manage pressure injuries, especially through nutrition? Yeah, let's get into the practical stuff. What are some of the things that healthcare professionals can do to help prevent and manage pressure injuries? Well, first and foremost, we need to make sure we're identifying those who are at risk, right? So using validated screening tools to assess both the risk of pressure injury and the risk of malnutrition. Early detection is key. And if someone is flagged as being at risk of malnutrition, it's really important to get a registered dietitian involved to do a comprehensive assessment and come up with a personalized nutrition care plan. So it's like a customized blueprint for each individual's needs. Exactly. And those plans, they can include a lot of different things, like making sure people are getting enough protein and energy, especially if they have a pressure injury, because, you know, healing takes a lot of extra resources. That makes sense. And then we also need to pay special attention to, like, high-risk groups, so people who are already malnourished or underweight, or even, as we talked about, morbidly obese. Those individuals, they need even more vigilant monitoring and support. So it's not just about treating the wound, it's about addressing the whole person, right? Their nutritional status, their overall health, their mm -hmm. lifestyle. Exactly. It's a holistic approach. And then, you know, we have to get creative sometimes. We need to think outside the box when it comes to finding ways to boost nutrient intake. Like what, what are some of those creative strategies? Well, it could be as simple as educating patients and their families about the importance of nutrition and wound healing, you know, making sure they understand why it's so important to eat a balanced diet especially when they're trying to recover from an injury. Or it could involve offering them like more appealing meals, you know, things that are easy to eat and digest, especially if they have trouble chewing or swallowing. Oh, no. And then, of course, there are nutritional supplements. Oh, uh, yes, the supplements. Yeah, they can be really helpful in certain situations. Like if someone's just not able to get enough nutrients from food alone, even with those dietary adjustments. But it's important to remember that supplements, they're not a magic bullet. They're meant to supplement a healthy diet, not replace it. That's a good reminder. We often hear about the importance of hydration for overall health, but I imagine it's even more crucial when it comes to wound healing, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Water is like the, the delivery truck for all those nutrients. You know, it carries them to the cells that need them and helps flush away waste products. And it also keeps the skin supple and moisturized, which can help prevent further breakdown. So... We need to make sure folks are drinking enough fluids, especially if they have a pressure injury. But what happens if someone just can't eat enough? Even with dietary adjustments and supplements, are there other options? Yeah, in some cases, if oral intake is just not cutting it and the risk of malnutrition is high, we might consider something called nasogastric feeding. So that's basically where liquid nutrition is delivered directly into the stomach through a tube. So it's like bypassing the mouth and esophagus altogether, sending those nutrients straight to where they're needed most. Exactly. It can be a real lifesaver for some people, mm. but it's a decision that's made very carefully by the healthcare team. Of course, of course. Well, this has been so enlightening. It's amazing how much we've learned about this connection between malnutrition and pressure injuries. And it's clear that a team approach is really essential to get the best possible outcomes for patients. Absolutely. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground today, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to explore. So we've been talking about preventing pressure injuries, which is obviously super important. But what about someone who already has a pressure injury? How does nutrition play into their recovery? Well, nutrition becomes even more crucial when someone's trying to heal from a pressure injury. You know, we talked about that construction crew analogy earlier. Right, the skin cells working hard to repair the damage. Exactly. Yeah. Well, now imagine that crew 
is working overtime. You know, they're under a tight deadline to get things fixed. So they need even more materials and fuel to do their job effectively. So it's like switching from routine maintenance to like full on emergency repairs, right? Mm -hmm. The demands are higher. That's a great way to put it. And so ideally, if someone's hospitalized with a pressure injury, a registered dietitian would be involved right from the beginning. You know, they'd assess the patient's overall nutritional status, taking into account their age, their health conditions, the severity of the injury, and their usual eating habits. Makes sense, everyone's different. So what would some of those personalized nutrition plans look like? Well, for some folks, it might be enough to just tweak their regular diet, like making sure they're eating plenty of protein-rich foods, maybe having smaller, more frequent meals throughout the day to make sure they're getting enough calories. And it's also important to consider things like, you know, if someone has difficulty chewing or swallowing, we need to make sure the foods are easy to eat. Yeah, practicality is key. But what about people who just can't seem to get enough from food alone? Right. So in those cases, we often turn to oral nutrition supplements. Mm. You know, they come in all sorts of forms, drinks, puddings, powders that you can mix into other foods. And they're a really convenient way to boost calorie and protein intake without having to eat massive amounts of food. So it's about finding solutions that fit into people's lives. But what if even supplements aren't enough? What happens then? Well, if someone's really struggling to get enough nutrition through their mouth and the risk of malnutrition is high, then the healthcare team might consider what's called enteral nutrition. Okay, I've heard that term before, enteral nutrition. Is that like feeding tubes? Yeah, exactly. There are different types of feeding tubes, but a common one is the nasogastric tube, which goes through the nose and down into the stomach. So it's a way to deliver nutrients directly, bypassing the mouth and esophagus altogether. Exactly. And it can be really effective for people who can't eat enough by mouth. But does the research actually show that all of this, you know, the dietary changes, the supplements, the feeding tubes, does it actually make a difference in how quickly pressure injuries heal? Oh, absolutely. The research is very clear that getting enough nutrition, especially protein and calories, helps pressure injuries heal faster. You know, they close up more quickly, they're smaller in size, and there are fewer complications. That's great to hear. You've talked about all these different interventions, but I'm curious, from your experience working with patients, can you share a story that really illustrates how powerful nutrition can be in this context? Sure. I had this patient, we'll call her Mrs. Jones, who was admitted with a stage two pressure injury on her heel. And she also had a history of diabetes and heart disease, and her appetite had been really poor for a while. So she was dealing with a lot, even beyond the pressure injury. Yeah, she really was. And it was clear that her nutritional status was making it harder for her wound to heal. So we took a multi-pronged approach, you know, addressing her medical conditions, providing wound care, and of course, focusing on her nutrition. We started by simplifying her meals, you know, offering her smaller portions more frequently, focusing on softer foods that were easier to digest. That makes sense. And we also added a high protein oral nutrition supplement, which she actually really enjoyed, which helped boost her calorie and protein intake. And, you know, it was amazing. After a few weeks, we started to see real improvement in her wound. It was healing more quickly. The skin around it looked healthier. And she just had more energy overall. Wow. So it wasn't just the wound itself. Her overall well-being improved, too. Exactly. And that's what's so incredible about nutrition. It doesn't just impact our physical health. It affects our mental and emotional well-being as well. You know, Mrs. Jones, she just seemed brighter. Her mood lifted. And she was even more motivated to participate in her physical therapy sessions. It was really a testament to the power of nourishing the body and the spirit. That's a fantastic story. It really highlights the interconnectedness of our physical and mental health. So we've talked a lot about what healthcare professionals can do, but what about individuals themselves? What can they do to prevent pressure injuries in the first place? That's a great question. And you know, it starts with the basics, right? A healthy, balanced diet that's rich in protein, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, you know, giving your body the building blocks it needs to maintain healthy, resilient skin. Makes sense. So it's all about those good nutrition habits we always hear about. Exactly. And staying well hydrated is super important, too. You know, drinking enough water helps keep the skin moisturized and elastic, which can help protect it from pressure damage. Okay, good to know. Are there any other practical tips, especially for folks who might be at higher risk of developing pressure injuries, like those with limited mobility? Absolutely. So for anyone who's bedridden or spends a lot of time sitting, frequent repositioning is key. You know, changing positions every couple of hours helps distribute the pressure and prevents any one area from being under constant force. 
And if you're caring for someone, you know, help them turn or shift their weight regularly. So it's about movement and avoiding prolonged pressure on any one spot. Exactly. And good skin care is also really important. Keeping the skin clean and dry can go a long way in preventing breakdown. You know, using a mild soap, patting the skin dry gently, and applying a moisturizer to keep it hydrated. And if you notice any redness or irritation, you know, don't ignore it. Address it early on to prevent it from developing into a full-blown pressure injury. So pay attention to those early warning signs. Yes, early detection is key. Well, this has been such an informative look at the role of nutrition in both preventing and treating pressure injuries. And it sounds like there's a lot that individuals can do to take control of their health and well-being. Absolutely. It's about being proactive, being aware of the risks, and making healthy choices. Well said. Now, I think it's time to take a closer look at the importance of that multidisciplinary approach we keep talking about. We'll dive into that right after this short break. All right, we're back. And we're wrapping up our deep dive into this fascinating connection between malnutrition and pressure injuries. It's amazing how much nutrition really does play a role in wound healing. Yeah, you know, it's something we often don't think about until there's a problem. It's true. And we've been talking a lot about this idea of a multidisciplinary approach to pressure injury care. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just one person's job. It's a whole team effort. Exactly. Exactly. So can you paint a picture for us? What does that ideal pressure injury care team look like? Who are all the players? Well, first and foremost, you've got the physician. Uh, they're the ones overseeing the patient's overall medical care, making sure any underlying health issues are being addressed, things that could be contributing to the pressure injury. Right, like diabetes or heart disease. Exactly. And then there are the nurses who are often, you know, right there on the front lines, the ones who are catching those pressure injuries early on, providing that hands-on wound care, educating patients and their families about ways to prevent them. Okay, so we've got the doctor and the nurses. What about the nutrition side of things? Right, well, that's where the registered dietitians come in. They're the experts at assessing a person's nutritional needs and developing those personalized care plans we talked about earlier. Those customized blueprints for making sure people are getting the nutrients they need to heal. Exactly. But it doesn't stop there. You might also have physical therapists involved. You know, they can help improve mobility and range of motion, which can help take pressure off vulnerable areas. And then occupational therapists, they can assess a person's ability to do their daily activities and recommend like tools or techniques to make things easier. You know, so they're not putting extra strain on their bodies. Oh, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. So we're talking about a whole team of specialists working together. Are there ever situations where you might need to bring in even more experts? Absolutely. For like really complex or stubborn wounds, you might need to involve a wound care specialist. They have like advanced training in all sorts of different wound care techniques. So it's like assembling a team of superheroes, each with their own unique skill set. That's a great analogy. And, you know, we also need to think about the patient's emotional and social well-being. So social workers can play a really important role in connecting people with resources and support services. It really does take a village. What I love about this team approach is that it's not just about treating the physical wound. It's about addressing the whole person. Absolutely. It's a holistic approach. Right. You know, you're recognizing that physical health, mental well-being, social support, it all plays a role in the healing process. And when all those pieces come together, that's when you see the best outcomes for patients, right? Yeah. But I'm curious, you know, coordinating care among so many different professionals, it can't always be easy. What are some of the challenges you've run into in trying to make this team-based approach work? Oh, there are definitely challenges. Logistically, you know, just getting everyone's schedules to line up, getting everyone in the same room at the same time, that can be a nightmare. Yeah, especially in a busy hospital setting, I imagine. Right. And sometimes, you know, there just aren't enough specialists available, especially in rural or underserved areas. And then, of course, there's the financial piece. Pressure injury care It can be expensive, and they can be a real barrier for some people. So it's not just about having the right people on the team. It's about having a system that supports and values this kind of collaborative care. That's a great way to put it. You know, we need systems that prioritize early detection, that provide adequate resources, that make sure everyone has access to the care they need, regardless of their location or their financial situation. Well, this has been such an incredible journey. We've covered so much ground from the science behind pressure injuries to the power of nutrition to the importance of teamwork. I feel like I have a whole new understanding of this issue. Me too. It's really fascinating, isn't it? 
It is. And, you know, I hope our listeners are walking away with a greater awareness of this connection between malnutrition and pressure injuries, a sense of empowerment to advocate for themselves and their loved ones, and an appreciation for the power of a team approach to healthcare. This is definitely a conversation that needs to continue, but for now, we're going to wrap things up. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive, and we'll see you next time for another fascinating exploration into the world of health and wellness.